All right, then we're going to begin our next class here on the um, conventual and the observant struggle. In our last class, we talked about the difference between the conventuals and the observants and how the two were living together uh, under the same roof, uh, the same roof as meaning under the same order, but living two completely different lifestyles. You had the conventuals at the Sacro Convento and other big friaries. And then you had the observants who were living in places like the Puziuncola, the Carcheri, Fonte Colombo, Greccio, um, the San Damianos. And so the uh, observance was growing and growing and growing and becoming more numerous or just as numerous as the conventional branch. Because the observants had their own vicar general underneath the general of the conventuals, the observants were allowed to receive their own novices and form them according to more of the primitive inspiration of the life. And so uh, controversy was starting to grow between the two groups as, you know, the questions arose. What does it mean to be a Franciscan? You know, is it this lifestyle where you can live in these big tremendous friaries, own the property, have expensive things in it and so forth? Or is it to live like the uh, observant friars who live in the friaries where Francis himself lived? Uh, and more in keeping with the rule, according to the Testament, and the life and writings of St. Francis. Now, the conventuals were justifying their lifestyle by saying that they were living according to the privileges and exemptions given to them. But again, they were living by not the rule, but by exemptions and privileges that were at sometimes contrary to the rule that Francis gave. As you mentioned, the Holy Father has a right to give those exemptions and give those privileges. However, one has to ask whether or not those exemptions and privileges are in keeping with the mindset and the heart of Francis himself. Okay, so we have these two groups together. So the conventuals were upset by the Council of Constance, which extended to all provinces by Martin V. This, um, these vicar, the vicar general, and then the vicar provincials over those territories who were uh, in charge of the observant groups. Okay. So in 1430, the general chapter of Assisi convened by the Pope, and at the chapter, it commissioned St. John of Capistrano to write a set of constitutions that would unite the order. It would unite the conventuals and the observants into one community. And so the constitutions were called the Martiani, Martiani, named after Pope Martin. Okay. So Capistrans and the chapter's decisions were that the observance vicars would be dismissed. The apostolic syndic syndic was restored. Steps were taken to do away with the perpetual endowments and the reception of money. So they were kind of a little bit of a give and take. You had the nuncio or the apostolic syndic replaced, but at the same time, the observance vicars would be dismissed and that they would get away from these perpetual endowments and the reception of money going back to the rule. And everyone seemed to agree at the general chapter. <clears throat> and then the minister general, William de Casale, William de, of Casale. Uh, he was Minister General from 1430 to 1442. 1430 to 1442. So 12 years he was Minister General. He swore to keep the constitutions, and he swore never to accept or request a dispensation. But soon after, he had himself released from this promise by the Pope. So he kind of meant it, but kind of didn't. As soon as the chapter ended... And uh, he swore he was going to uphold it. He was right there next to St. John Capistrano, right along his side. And then William sought the exemption from that. Pope Martin published a papal bull on August 23rd, 1430. Pope Martin V, August 23rd, 1430. He it was a papal bull. Which, I'm sorry, I don't have the name for it. And this gave permission to keep and administer real estate and houses and to collect revenues. So here they just have this general chapter. John of Capistrano made all these agreements. They come together, and then all of a sudden the Pope decides that he's going to get, not the Pope, the Minister General is going to get from the Pope dispensation uh, to follow the constitutions, and then he gets a papal bull from the same Pope uh, to keep and administer real estate and houses and to collect revenues. So again, back to receiving money. So 1434, the conventuals retracted their keeping of the constitutions just four years after the agreement. And so the observance had their vicars reinstated. Kind of like, if you're going to play that way, we'll play our way. So you want to put this back in? Well, then we'll go back as well. 
1438, St. Bernardino of Siena was named Vicar General of the Observance. And the conventuals were opposed to this naming and the replacing of a vicar general that would be over the observant friars. The observance continued to increase throughout Europe. Provincials and vicariates were broken into two groups. Each group was governed, each group was governed by their prospective vicar general or the prospective vicar provincial. Um, and so you had the cismontane, the ultramontane. So you had the these two different groups here. They came the papal bull Ut Sacra. This is now 1446. We have a new pope, Ut Sacra, Pope Eugene IV, publishes Ut Sacra, 1446. And this is the bull that led to the eventual split in the order. Okay, the observance, it said, could hold their own chapters and elect their own vicar generals. So now they were pretty much being separated from the conventuals because they were able to actually have their own general chapters and elect their own vicar general. And they could hold provincial chapters and appoint their own provincials to their territories. And then, by this point, uh, Bernardine of Siena has passed away, and St. Bernardine of Siena uh, was canonized. And this was the trump card for the observance. Their former vicar general was passed, was passed and is now being canonized. And so they're like, well, you know, we had a saint at the head of ours our reform here, and so we're going to claim this as our own. We're the real friars. We're the real descendants of St. Francis. You conventuals are the mitigation of Francis, and we're the true friars who have followed after him in the manner in which he wished. In 1451, the observant general chapter was held in Bus Barcelona, and it issued definitive constitutions for the observance of Western Europe, and they're called the Statutes of Barcononesnesia, B-A-R-C-H-I-N-O-N-E-N-S-I-A. B-A-R-C-H, Barch, I-N-O-N-E-N-O-N-E-N-S-I-A. So in 1461, the Cismontane province revived the Martiani constitutions. And so you have these two provinces, uh, two territories, the Ultramontane and the Cismontane, Kind of following two different sets of constitutions under the observance umbrella now. However, things are going along rather peacefully. The goal was to live the rule according to the testament and the writings and life of St. Francis as the guides. So there were some further events. There was a papal bull by uh, called the Bull of Concord by Pope Callistus III in 1456. Pope Callistus III, 1456, Bull of Concord. It said that all vicars were to be elected by the general chapter of all friars. Observants were to attend but could not elect, be elected to office. So it created this, okay, we're going to have only one general chapter for both groups, but yet you observant people, you can't be elected. Uh, that's not going to go over too well. That was followed up by a papal bull two years later by the new pope, Pius II, and that canceled the previous bull of the Bull of Concord. So... Uh, you can see why people weren't taking these bulls seriously, because every time there was one bull, there was another bull, and one bull was canceled at the other bull, and it turned out there was just a lot of bull, and no one knew what bull to believe, okay? <laughs> that makes it a little bit clear uh, with, with all these papal bulls. So Pope Sixtus IV, we have a new pope now, Pope Sixtus IV, he was a former conventual friar. His name was Francesco of Rovere. Francesco of Rivera, Pope Sixtus IV. This is the second uh, Franciscan Pope. We had Nicholas, and now we have Sixtus IV. And he had sympathy for the reform movement. So old discrepancies with, the loyal, with local clergy flared up again because the Pope was a Franciscan who was now once again giving more privileges and exemptions to the friars. He published Mare Magnum in 1474, and then he also published Sacri Predicatorum et Bonorum Ordines in 1479. By both bulls, the Pope increased the privileges and the friars' relations to the bishops and local clergy got worse. It caused a storm to rise against the friars, not so much the observance as the conventuals. As a side note, the storm continued until the, fourth, until the Fifth Lateran Council, and down through the pontificate of Pope Leo X, just so uh, be aware of how bad this was. Even up until the Council of Trent, there was controversy about how much freedom the friars should have as opposed to their 
in, in conjunction with or in opposition to the bishops and diocesan clergy. It really was until the Council of Trent and the publishing, uh, publishing of canon law uh, that the force of canon law kind of settled these disputes between what the, uh, of the authority of the bishop over the friars and the friars' relationship to the bishops and the local clergy. Okay, now back to where we were. We're now at the year 1500. So between 1474 and 1500, during those 26 years, there's relative peace between the two groups. And then the Cardinal Jimenez of Cisneros, Cisneros is C-I-S-N-E-R-O-S, -S, Jimenez of Cisneros, had a run-in with the conventuals. After he sought to unite the order underneath the observance, he really wanted, he's like, he, had, he didn't like what he saw in the, in the conventuals, so he tried to reunite the order for, by taking the conventuals and putting them underneath the observance now, trying to flip it around the other way. So instead of the conventual being the minister general, the observance would be the minister general, the conventionals have to come under the, minister, the, the observance, and they have to conform to the life of the observance. Uh, and he had the support of the monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella. That kind of helped a bit. Meanwhile, the conventional minister general, Giles Delfini, promulgated new constitutions. The constitutions of Nove Reformationis, A-R-E-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N-E-S, Nove Reformationis. And then they were approved by Pope Alexander VI in, uh, in 1550. Uh, oh, 1500. Yeah, 15, 1500, 1500. So this had the purpose of reforming the conventuals and restoring unity. So the hope of these new constitutions by the Minister General Giles of Delfini was to try to somehow reform the conventuals so it would end any kind of controversy between the conventuals and the observance. Invested with extensive powers by the Pope, uh, bless, uh, uh, Minister General Giles of Delfini traveled all over Italy, Spain, and France to try to bring about reform. So this guy was serious about it, um, but he didn't have too much success. He tried to get the monarchs to support him to kind of force the friars into this um, more um, uh, disciplined form of the life. He incurred dislike from both groups. So the poor guy, nobody liked him, right? The guys who uh, wanted reform didn't feel he went far enough, and the guys who didn't want reform felt he was going too far. So uh, it's it's tough trying to take the middle ground. And uh, because when you take the middle ground, both groups hate you. Pick a side, I guess, is what you have to say on that one. So six years later, 1506, he resigned at a general chapter. At present at the general chapter were the conventionals, the observance, and then what they called the minor right groups. There were certain groups that were not coming underneath the observance headship, but were living underneath the headship of the conventuals with their own particular set of constitutions. And these were the Clarini, which we talked about already, those descendants of Angelo Clarino, who were the spiritual branch there. The Colatines, which were the reform of St. Colette. The uh, Amadietti and the Lupini. So the chapter that they held to try to bring about a unity there with everybody present had really no effect. So a little bit after that, in 1508, Pope Julius II published Statutes for Union. 1508, Pope Julius II published Statutes for Union. And they said the observance from Italy blocked its implementation. So they, the Pope tried this, but yet the friars from Italy, the observance didn't want it because they felt it weakened the life. The observance also blocked the union by preventing it to be brought before the Lateran Fifth Council in 1515. So there was fighting on that level as well by trying to block it from being brought to any further approval. And all were insisting that the Pope give the observance their own minister general. It seemed to be the only answer to the controversy was to actually split the order where you have one general over the conventuals and one general over the observance. Now, let me back up and say this. During this time period, while this controversy is going on and time is happening, the conventuals are becoming more and more comfortable with their monastic form of life, their conventual life where they own property, they're accepting money and so forth, inheritances, and they're praying the divine office and so forth. They're good religious. I mean, they're good friars in that sense. They're not like, you know, bad guys, uh, but they're not observing the rule in accord with the Testament, the writings of Francis and um, Francis's life. 
The observers started out real good, and although they were persevering in it, they began to weaken out in the ownership of profit, property. There was some letting go of uh, that poverty where they were accepting money and using money here and there. Um, they began to fiddle around with some other things with bigger houses, and so they were starting to lose their original observance. You know, uh, it's now a good hundred and something years after we saw Gentile begin the, the reform and then Paul of Trinchy that began the observant reform. And over these years, these hundred or so years, the reform movement had been weakened out. Part of that was because they were trying to bring all these other small reform movements onto one headship and they weren't able to do it. Or they had the ultramontane and the cismontane, two provinces, two territories that were following two separate sets of constitutions. And so there was a bit of disunity to the uh, reform. And so this allowed for friars to play more, uh, uh, play more around with the rule and be a little bit more permissive. And so the observance were come, become, started to become very much like the conventuals. Not as far removed from the rule as the conventuals, but they now were taking more of a mediocre stand. So you, what they went from being a, a radical observance or a strict observance to becoming more of a moderate observance. And then you had the conventions on the other one hand becoming a lax observance. Now let me explain these three terms before we get any further because they're really important. And I'll probably go over this again. When we use the word strict, moderate, or laxed, we are not using it pejoratively. It's not to insult anybody. These came from the book by Duncan Nemo, uh, Reform and Division in the Franciscan Order. And when he looked at the different ways in which groups had observed the rule, he said there were three ways to observe the rule. There was strict, a moderate, and a laxed observance. The laxed observance was the observance that accepted exemptions and privileges and so forth, uh, that relaxed the actual strong points of the rule, the precepts of the rule, the counsels of the rule. They followed more of their statutes and more of their um, exemptions and privileges than they did the actual rule of Francis guided by the Testament. The uh, uh, mediocre, the midway, middle way, I should say, mediocre is not a really good word. Um, the um, uh, moderate form of the living of the life. Uh, and the moderate form, uh, it kind of made the balance between the two. They were, they were lenient on some things with privileges and relaxations and strict on others. And so there might have been a use of money, but a limited use of money. The friars may have had large houses, but they still didn't own those houses. They may have had things, but not that many things. They may have had good things, but not the nicest of things. So more of a mediocre uh, or a moderate form of living the rule. And then there was the strict observance, which is how the conventuals began. I'm sorry, the observance began. They began with that strict observance that they're going to follow the rule to the letter guided by the testament and, by, and um, guided by the words and example of St. Francis, okay? So by 1517, though, we already have now, 100 and so years later, after Paul Trinci began the reform, the conventional, the observance have moved to a mediocre, moderate form of the life. They've moved away from that strict observance, and now they're living more of a moderate form of the life. So 1517, there's a general chapter in Rome, and... Uh, it's called by Pope Leo X, okay? The observants, the conventuals, and the representatives from smaller groups were all in attendance. The conventuals refused to accept the reform or to give the observants their own general. Okay, so the conventuals refused to accept the reform or to give the observants their own general. So the Pope decreed total separation. Okay, the papal bull, Ite Vos. I-T-E-V-O-S by Pope Leo. This is what we call, um, so Ite Vos by Pope Leo X. And this happened on May 19th, 1517. And this is followed by another one on June 12th. Okay, the papal bull Ite Vos, a very important document because this was the document that separated the order into two separate communities. So this papal bull excluded conventuals from the election of the minister general. And the Minister General was now known as the Minister General of, of the all the order of the of minor order of, of minors. He would be given the seals of the order, and the vicar provincial would become ministers. The reformed friars subject to this minister will be known as Ordo Frate Minorum Regularis Observantiae. Okay, 
to the order of friars minor regular of the regular observance. So there was now a minister general and there were provincials of the new group with the name order of friars minor of the regular observance. And this occluded the Amidietti, the Colatines, the Clarini, and the Lupini. Okay? They became part of that observance reform and it was all brought together into this unity. At the same time, it was then separated from the conventuals. And then it said the conventual general was to be called the minister general fratum of the, of the conventual friars. The minister general of the conventual friars. Uh, he would have to be confirmed by the observant general, uh, but that, that provision was never, never uh, enforced. So the conventuals were not to be interfered with in the possession of their legal privileges. So the observance could interfere with the conventuals having their own privileges and so forth. Um, and it became forbidden to transfer from one order to the other. In other words, you had to choose a side, and that's where you stayed. You couldn't choose one to the other. Each order was to keep their property it obtained prior to the bull. Itebos is also known as the bull of unity because it united the reforms, but it was also the bull of division because it separated the two, the conventions from the observance. So in 1518, there was a general chapter and it grouped the hermitages into one province, accepting the Amidieti. They were abolished in 1568 by Pope Pius V. Now, reform groups. In 1568, the Clarini were abolished. 1518, the Colatines became the province of France, distinct from the province of Paris. They adopted the title of the Recollects. It's also formed the province of Flanders and Lower Germany. That's St. Colette's reform. Now, statistical data. In 1455, there were 20,000 observants. 1493, 22,910 observants. In 1517, there were 20 to 25,000 conventuals in 34 provinces. Now listen to this. This shows you how they were growing rapidly, the conventuals. So in 1517, the time of the split, there were 20, 20 to 25,000 conventuals in 34 provinces. There are also, in 1517, 30 to 35,000 observants in 53 provinces. 30 to 35,000 observants in 53 provinces. There's 10,000 more observants than there are conventuals. So you see the order, it wasn't just any small reform groups anymore over the 200 years since, or the 170 so years since the, uh, the reform of Paula Trinci. It wasn't just a few houses, a few friars. This grew into a massive part not equal, but even greater than the conventuals, okay? Um, it's important to note that the uh, conventuals uh, or the observance, neither can claim to have been um, broken off from the other, okay? Both can claim direct descendancy to St. Francis. The conventuals will always say they were first, and the observance came along later. The observers say, we were along the whole way, and then you guys, through exemptions and privileges, broke yourselves away before, you, before the split happened in 1517. The question really comes down to what constitutes um, being the first, right? <laughs> and so both were derived, but came directly from St. Francis. One lived by exemptions and by, uh, of the rule in the, uh, Francis. The other one lived it, or tried to live it, uh, faithfully and turned out to live it moderately. Okay, so the answer to it is both. Okay, so uh, Itebos did not bring uniformity to observance reform, nor did it bring them to a middle course. 1518 and 1523, the general chapters wrote new constitutions, which followed those of Barcelona. And then the Cismontane province rejected them because they had the Martiani constitution. So the Observant reform never was able to come together as one complete whole. And this perhaps was the failure of the observant reform. It was trying too hard to accommodate everybody. And then once it tried to make this middle ground, it was rejected. Everyone wanted to follow what they had. Okay. Um, so provinces started accepting their own sets of constitutions. And there was a forced amalgamation as certain groups did not want to give up their constitutions. So you may have had the Colatines who had a very strong set of constitutions that would adopt another set of constitutions that didn't want to because theirs were stricter. Or the other ones didn't want to adopt their constitutions because theirs were stricter and they liked what they had, right? 
So by, late, by the late 15th century, the observants were in a very similar situation to the conventionals and were in need of reform and were in need of a, a deeper movement of, um, of, of a growth in their own spiritual journey, okay? Their own reform. By the time of 1528, there was already a great need for the order to have a reform again. The order had not done what it hoped to do. The observed reform did not accomplish the goal of bringing about the reform of the order. It had a reform movement, but then it began to, it tried to pull together these splinters, but then eventually it splintered. And we'll see how this uh, is greatly affected in the cap, uh, uh, bringing about the Capuchin reform, how this brought about the Capuchin reform and, uh, and why the Capuchin reform actually lasted while the observant reform did not. While the observant reform became moderate, while the Capuchin reform was able to maintain a strict observance for three centuries. So in 1496, John of Guadalupe received permission to live out the rule in Granada. He was under the minister general, not the provincial minister. Now this included they could preach anywhere. They could wear the pointed hood and the shortened habit without sandals. And they became known as the Discoused. That was 1496. John of Guadalupe received that permission to live out the rule in Granada, uh, wearing the long pointed hood, uh, going barefoot and so forth. And they were known as the Discoused Friars. In 1517, they became their own custody with their own set of constitutions under the observance. Okay, so we have a bit of a struggle going on now here in the um, in the in, in the situation we're in. Okay, we have the conventual life, which is pretty much now settled. This is what the conventual life looks like, as we mentioned earlier. You want to be a conventional Franciscan, you want to live this form of life, this is the way it is, it isn't changing. There's, there's exemptions, there's privileges and so forth, large friaries, grandiose liturgies, lots of studies, few lay brothers, mostly clerical, uh, clericalism that's set in where the lay brothers do a little bit of work, you only get the lay brothers that you need. Um, you have hired people to take care of a lot of the other stuff, so the friars can get themselves over to studies and so forth. And then you have the observant reform, which does have a particular way of living, but you have all of these other small groups that have their own particular ways of living. And so you have a bit of a controversy going on, a struggle going on with that. And this is going to set up for the Capuchin reform. Because the observant reform is not able to pull it all together and create a set of constitutions that all the brothers could agree upon and could observe, and observing them, observe the rule of Francis guided by the Testament, uh, because they weren't able to do that, it was just inevitable that there would come forth a reform that would be able to do this, okay? Um, and again, like I said, these are not guys who are heretical, the guys not wearing their habits, or they're out doing this, that they were good religious. It wasn't a matter of religious observance. It wasn't a matter of fidelity to the church. It wasn't a matter of fidelity to um, certain Franciscan spiritual ideals. It was a question of the rule. It was a question of living the rule as Francis had written it. It's what brought about the observant reform, and it's what will bring about the Capuchin reform. I can't stress that enough because I think it's important that we realize you know, we live in a day and age ourselves where religious life, you know, if you're faithful to the church and you wear your habit most of the time, you're considered to be a, 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 an orthodox, strong, observant religious, you know, where in their day and age that was a given. It was a given that you wear your habit, be faithful to the church, the magisterium, be faithful to the basic precepts of religious life. Um, and, um, you know, it was all a matter of whether or not of how deep you're going to go with the charism that's been given to you, how faithful you're going to be to the to the founder. OK, so in our next class, we're going to look at um, the uh, accomplishments of the order, the good things that the order gave to the church and the blessings that the order has been upon the church. We take a step outside of the interior struggles and the battles to live the life and the, the battles to live as faithful sons of St. Francis. And we're going to switch to look at all the good that the order has done for the church. You know, because it's easy to get focused upon, especially as we're studying Franciscan history and we're diving into how these reforms came about and the changing of the habit, all this other stuff, and uh, getting and about money and stuff like this. And we forget about how good uh, the friars, what good the friars were doing for the church universal. So I want to make sure we focus on the good that the church order gave uh, to the church. 
Um, oh, that was right. I forgot to mention. Um, thank you. So we had the um, conventual habit, right? We talked about how in 1318, the habit was changed to where you had the round piece coming over here, over the shoulder, kind of rounded back to the in the back, somewhat to a point. Uh, and then with the uh, observant reform, part of the observant reform was to adopt the habit to the habit in keeping with that of St. Francis. Now, they did it a bit differently. They didn't go back to the habit attached with the hood attached to it coming to a point. What they did was they kept the habit that the conventionals were living, wearing, and according to the rule, it was supposed to come down to a point at the court. So what they did was they cut it short, so it just came across the shoulders, a little bit across the front here, and then it went to a point, the cap, the capuch, had a point in the back. So you had a little hood, and then the, the kind of the um, scapular part coming down to a point in the back and a round part here. Um, now, there was a funny funny stories about Gianna Capistrano or Bernardino de Siena, one of the two, or both of them, or various members of the, um, of the, of the observant reformers would find conventionals uh, and they'd grab their capuches and they'd take their scissors and they would cut up their capuches so that it went back to the point. So that wasn't nice of them. You know, they had um, uh, tried to say that, you know, this is the way that, that Francis wore the habit and we have to wear it with a point in the back. And so they would cut up a <laughs> conventional habit when they found them, if that a pair of scissors on them. Uh, but it did now create two separate forms of the habit. You know, so you had the original habit that St. Francis wore with the hood attached going down to the point. In 1318, that was changed to having the two-piece habit with the with the kind of scapular piece with the little hood, with the, this capuche that came over the shoulders, down more of a Dominican style like that. And then you had the, uh, after the, the reform with Paula Trintry, you had the changing of the habit where they changed the capuche to be shorter in the front, just coming to the edge of the shoulders and draping down to a point in the back with a tiny hood that can almost fit over the head, depending on how they created it. So I'm going to bring that up. Thank you. So we'll see how that changes with the Capuchin reform. There'll be the restoration of the original habit as St. Francis wore it with the long pointed hood and um, sewn on to the tunic. But we'll get to that when we talked about uh, Capuchin history. We'll get to the Capuchin habit itself. Um, but again, we're going to come back to uh, the, uh, the good things that the order has had to offer the church and how the order has greatly influenced the very life of the church how it has influenced the church in missions, how it's influenced the church liturgically, how it has influenced the church uh, as, um, uh, in, in, the, in governance, how it's affected the life of the, the, uh, the world itself, and even in um, mission territories and the establishment of um, you know, the, the great expanse beyond the oceans. So our next class will take us far beyond 1517, uh, but it'll just be a nice little way of uh, ending this particular course by looking at the good things that the order has offered the world. And then we'll move on to our, our next class, and the next class will be on the Capuchin reform. All right, so we're gonna end a little bit early today. This will be a shorter class. So uh, you have a blessed day, and we'll catch you all later. All right, thank you, everybody.